Okay, buddy. Let's continue on. So first off, we talked about how our saturation temperature changes with pressure. Now, I can change pressure if I try to expand the piston. I can compress something as well and change pressure that way. But another way that pressure changes is with elevation. So as I go higher up into the atmosphere, the pressure drops. Now at first it's not all that much, but eventually as I get about 20,000 meters, you can see that it's really dropped quite a bit. It's going down a lot. And if my pressure drops, then my boiling temperature also drops. This is why if you're at higher elevations, it's easier to boil water and also harder to breathe. Now, when we change phase, so when I go from a liquid all the way to a gas, we've already determined that they are the same temperature to start. So saturated liquid, this is 100 degrees Celsius. Saturated vapor, this is also 100 degrees Celsius. But I was adding energy that entire time. So the entire time I was going from liquid to a vapor, I was adding energy. So where did that energy go? Well, it went into something called latent heat or latent energy. So latent heat is simply the amount of energy that is absorbed or released during a phase change process. And that's why it's called hidden. Latent means hidden. And it's called hidden for a reason because you don't see it in a change in temperature. You don't see it in a change in pressure. You see it in a change in phase. Okay, so there's a couple of different ones of these. There's latent heat diffusion and latent heat vaporization. Fusion is when I'm melting. So if I go from a solid to a liquid, I am going to be putting energy into my material to make it change phase. So I'm looking at the amount of energy here. I'm going to have a little meter right here. Okay, so this is my energy meter. And so this is for a solid. So I've got a little ice cube right here. And then if I add more energy, my energy meter goes up, and now it is a liquid. So that is what's happening there. This difference, that is the latent energy, okay? It's hidden. I don't see it in the temperature change. I only see it in my phase change. And a little scribbles. Wait, wait, wait. Then there's a latent heat of vaporization. This is the amount of heat that's absorbed during vaporization or released when I condense. And this is why your refrigerator works. So your refrigerator works in a very amazing way. What happens is you have a cycle. So in your freezer, usually, there are some wires going along it. You don't usually see these because they're usually hidden inside the walls, but they're there nonetheless. And what's happening there is that you have pipe going through and it has a liquid in it, Freon. And while it is going through there, because it's at a really low pressure, it begins to turn into a gas. The only way it can do that is by stealing energy. Energy has to go from your freezer into the refrigerant. And then that flows out. The only way your freezer can give energy is if its temperature goes down. And so that's why your freezer cools down. Then on the back of your fridge, Usually you are able to see these, you have coils, you have pipes as well, and they usually go back and forth kind of like this. What happens here is once again, I have a pipe, but now it's completely filled with gas. And what I do is I make the pressure very high. When the pressure is high, it wants to condense. When it condenses, it has to get rid of that latent heat. And so it expels it into your kitchen, heating up your kitchen and completing the cycle. So that's how your refrigerator works and all based on this hidden energy that's in vaporization, that's in condensation. Pretty cool, right? At least I think it is. Okay, so if you want to know like how much it is, so at one atmosphere pressure, which is not how much pressure that is in your um, Freon and your um, refrigerator, but at one atmosphere, just vaporizing takes 2,257 kilojoules of energy per kilogram. It takes quite a bit, and that much is released when it condenses. Now, some important things we learn about from pressure saturation and temperature saturation. So if I have a test chamber right here and it's, you know, I want to keep it really, really cold. Well, I would put something really, really cold next to it. If I put liquid nitrogen next to it, liquid nitrogen is at negative 196 degrees Celsius. Now at our regular standard pressure, atmospheric pressure, liquid nitrogen will not stay liquid nitrogen. It's going to be, immediately begin to vaporize. And you might be thinking, well, if it's vaporizing, then that means that my test chamber is going to start heating up because it's vaporizing. 
but it's not. Because my saturation temperature is a constant, when my pressure is constant, it's not going to change. The temperature is going to stay the same the entire time, so long as my pressure right out here is constant. And that means that so long as I have some liquid nitrogen touching this guy, that liquid nitrogen will always be negative 196 degrees Celsius because it's always vaporizing. The only way it could change temperature is if all of it's vaporized and then we're at a superheated vapor. So at that point, then the um, nitrogen vapor could begin to heat up. But until all my liquid is gone, the vapor that is escaping as well as the liquid will be the same temperature, which is negative 196 degrees Celsius. That could be helpful. It also explains why ice water works. So if you have a cup of water, you fill it with some water, you put some ice cubes in it, the temperature of that water is going to be constantly equal to 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius until all of the ice cubes are gone. As soon as those ice cubes are gone, it will begin to heat up. But until the ice cubes are gone, it will be the same temperature. And the other thing is you can't actually make it colder than 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius um, by adding ice to it because the ice itself will just start to cool the water until it's the same temperature. Now that it's going to begin to freeze all the water, at that point, okay, yes, it can begin to get colder, but then it's no longer liquid water, it's now ice, and so, you know, you can't really drink it. Okay, now I've got a question for you. What happens to a fruit when you put it at low pressures? What happens? Why would I care about this? You do care, because you've probably been eating this before. Well, the answer is, if you lower the pressure that a fruit or a vegetable is at, um, you are going to vacuum cool it, okay? You're going to vacuum cool it. Um, you've probably heard of freeze drying. This is what's happening there. They reduce the pressure, and when they reduce the pressure, what happens is one, it begins to freeze, and two, it begins to dry because all of the liquid water inside of that vegetable will begin to vaporize out of it. So I might start with, you know, an apple looking kind of like this. Oh my goodness, these art classes are doing amazing. But as I reduce the pressure, it is going to begin to cool. And as um, I get to this point, I still have pretty much a normal apple. It's going to be a little bit worse for the way right here. But below that point, it is going to begin to shrivel up. Why? Because all the water inside of it is going to begin to vaporize, and it's also going to be getting very, very cold. And when I do this, I'm getting rid of all the water in it without having to cook my food. Because the only other way I can get rid of the water in this is to cook it. And if I don't want to cook it and change its um, cons uh, consistency, I would have to freeze it instead, freeze dry it to get rid of the water vapor in it. So this is how freeze drying works. It's another little important aspect, though this is not super important to this class, okay? It's not, we don't have to worry about it too much. But it's a cool little detail. Okay, last little detail. This is just a fun one, um, which I really like to bring in here. It's simply saying that in 1775, ice was made by evacuating the airspace in a water tank. So they wanted to make ice. How did they do that? They had liquid water, and they began to make, um, they began to pump out the water, um, they put, pump out the vapor. So this air above it was very, very low. I'm going to turn right over to this again. So the pressure above it was very, very low. Now, eventually, if I have a low pressure, all the water is going to go to vapor. It's eventually going to disappear. But during that process, it is not at equilibrium. So it's a non-equilibrium process to, to start. And what will happen is that the water on the top will begin to freeze because the vapor is pumping out of it so quickly that all of that latent energy is leaving it, and it causes it turn to ice. The ice itself will eventually sublimate, which means it'll go straight to a vapor. But until that happens, it will be um, just ice. And this could be helpful for your project, just saying, okay? We'll talk about that next time. Helpful for your project. I'm not saying you're gonna actually be able to do this, but you could, you could, depending on your machining skills. Well, that's it for this time. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.